My name's Lane Norton. I am a bodybuilding coach, I guess. Powerlifting, bikini, physique, anything to do with physique sports or strength, I, I coach it. Uh, also just recently started a supplement line. And um, yeah, I mean, my background is a PhD in nutrition and a bachelor's in biochemistry. So basically a, a nerd who got really interested in lifting uh, heavy stuff. My name is Paul Ravella. I own ProPhysique.com, so I'm a physique coach. I also compete as a competitive uh, natural bodybuilder, and I recently competed in men's physique. So I help people basically achieve their goals, whether it be fat loss, competition, or anything in between. So my coaching strategy would be to use whatever works, which, uh, so I'm a pragmatist above all else. Regardless of what science says, regardless of anything else, I, I try to use what works for the individual. Now. Over the course of time, I've kind of veered towards strategies that typically work for most people. And um, this is, you know, nutrition-wise, we're big advocates of flexible dieting. Um, and I find that that is a more sustainable way to approach nutrition. It's also a more um, specific way to approach nutrition in terms of knowing what you're getting in and being able to modulate several variables uh, based on how you're responding at the time. And then in terms of training, it's very much the same. So we're tracking volume. We're, we're, we're trying to get the most out of our biomechanics in terms of what we do with the lifts. Um, but there are certain things, and I, I can bring up you know, specific examples to kind of prove my point. I, I very rarely will say things like, don't do this ever, or always do this, because everyone is different. Just like a different cue may work for somebody on a deadlift, and it doesn't matter what cue they use as long as that cue gets them in the proper position, right? And it's the same thing with nutrition, right? So, for example, somebody may say to me, I may say, you know, we really try to get more carbs pre and post workout. But if somebody says to me, you know what, I train at 5 a.m. in the morning, I get a really upset stomach if I eat too much before I go in, do I have to eat, eat those carbs before I go in? I'm not gonna be like, yes, you have to eat those carbs, and that's all, and you know what, or no, you need to wait till you get off work till you go train. If somebody, if they feel better, they perform better that way, I'm gonna encourage them to try and eat a little bit to a point where it doesn't upset their GI, but I'm gonna work with them and massage what I usually do because for that person, it's not a reasonable expectation. So, uh, you know, basically I come from the, from the background of Lane. I don't know if he wants to be considered my mentor, but I certainly uh, I'll claim you. consider him that. He was my first coach, thank goodness, because I didn't have to deal with uh, a lot of the bad strategies that can be involved in the coaching world, especially amongst the more popular coaches. So it was to my benefit that I was coached by one of the best, if the, not the best, nutrition coach in the world. And I apply those same strategies and philosophies to, to my clients and even to those people I meet. I'm fortunate enough that I get to travel with Lane, uh, do seminars and camps with Lane and learn from some of the best minds in the sport on a consistent basis. So the things that we're doing now, we weren't doing two years ago, and the things that we're doing now, we won't be doing in two years. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a good point. I mean, the, the overall strategy may be similar. Absolutely. But there are certain things that we may, we may change. Our, I mean, Mike talked yesterday about how, you know, I was one of the first people he followed on bodybuilding.com, and I'm sure you, you can go back and you can look and you can see articles I wrote five, six, seven years ago. There are some things that I, I they conflict with what I say now, yep. and that's because I'll make an educated guess based on you know peripheral data, based on what I know. I'll make an educated guess, and if I'm wrong, I'll come back later and say, you know what, I messed this up, yep. right? But I'm always going to try and get it as right as possible. But I think we fall into a trap of like the guruism. People sure. want to believe that there's somebody out there who has all the answers. And when I give seminars, I always try to tell people, you know, listen, this is just my these are my like. I feel like I have high value to add because yeah. of my experience, because of my lab time, because of my research. But I'm invariably gonna get stuff wrong. I mean, look at, I'm not comparing myself to this person, but look at Albert Einstein. More of Einstein's theories were wrong than they were right. right. But he got people thinking, thinking in such a different perspective that he completely changed the field of physics and how we viewed the universe. It's so, not that far off from what you did though because it was more common to eat such well, a restrictive a plan scale. <laughs> yeah, on a smaller scale, but for for may have had a bigger impact on more people's lives because n nutrition is something that we all deal with. And so what happens with us is we get contacted by so many people who have been put through the ringer by those who don't really understand nutrition and yet they get the opportunity to coach others and that's a very dangerous thing. Yeah. A lot of a lot of people will, you know, 
They said, well, how do these bad diets get, 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 get so popular? Because it was passed down from one coach to another, then they started coaching people, they gave people the same diet, and so on and so forth. We talked to a girl at the Olympia who, she went to a coach and said she wanted to gain muscle, and uh, that coach, she was maintaining her body weight. She knew what she was taking calorie-wise. She was maintaining her body weight in 1,700 calories a day. And that coach put on 1,400 calories a day in one hour of cardio for a muscle gain program. Like, do you even science? Like, you know, like that, that, that. But when, I always compare it to like architecture. So it's great to have science. It's great to have experience. Ideally, you have both, right? A great, but... If nothing else, I prefer somebody understand metabolism, right? Sure. So, because a, as an architect, they have, they have to be both good artists and good at engineering and mathematics and whatnot. Now, an artist could just copy down what they did and keep doing it, but if you ask them to do something from scratch, they can't do it. They don't, all they can do is copy down the same thing over and over. Yeah. And by the same token, somebody who knows all the science but maybe isn't a skilled uh, drawer they're not gonna be able to do as good of a job. So ideally you have both, but there are good coaches out there who have done either one or the other, and I'm not trying to make that mutually exclusive. I think but I think we should all be pushing towards, as a coach, I wanna have experience with what my clients are doing, and I wanna have a back, I'm always trying to push myself to learn more. I never right. wanna feel like I'm static in my education. Yes, uh, and I'm at 39 years old, I'm, I'm back in school because of the things that Lane has taught me and that I don't understand. I wanna apply that to myself and continue getting better. Uh, Lane is continuing to get better. He's, he, he has not stopped learning since he graduated. He's continuing to educate himself on the latest research and be involved in all the stuff that's going on in the sport that we can provide better information, not only to his own training, which he, which he has done through some research of Dr. Mike Zoros's, but you know, going forward, you know, we're gonna be continuing to, to add to that. Actually, it's funny, I freaked my wife out a few months ago because I was getting all fired up listening to Les Brown. Les Brown. It's like in the last, the last year, what skills have you acquired? What books have you read? Scary. I'm, like, I'm like, ooh. So I come out, I'm like, honey, I'm going back to school. I'm gonna go get a ma I'm gonna go get a master's. And she goes, You have a PhD. Why are you going to go get back and get a master's? I'm like, well, I, that's a nutrition. I don't have one in exercise science. So she's like, just just think about it for a little bit first before we before we dive in. So yeah. but I'm like I'm always feel compelled to push myself. So uh, I would say flexible dieting is the ability to always eat mindfully and never engage in kind of neurotic or, I don't wanna say neurotic, but um, unmindful eating practices and being flexible enough that you're never, you're never, I think that's the best definition is you're never excluding food groups. Nothing's ever off the table, okay? Now, so that means you're tracking your protein, carbs, and fats, right? And then you're eating foods to fit those. But people get this completely wrong, too. So I'll have people who they, you know, it all depends on context of how strict you are with flexible dieting. If you're preparing for a show, you're down to 100 grams of carbs a day, is it intelligent to get 75% of your carbs from two Pop-Tarts? No, because you're not gonna hit your fiber intake, it's gonna be really hard to hit your protein with that small amount of carbs left over, all that kind of stuff. So you're gonna wanna choose more voluminous, filling foods just by default. And you're probably not going to, even though you could theoretically go out to eat, you're, I'm not going to do that very often because it's going to increase my variability of what I can control, right? But if I'm in the off season, I'm just in a maintenance phase, I'm in a gaining phase, is it a big deal if I want to go out and eat? No, because the, the, the variability is less important because if I can maintain my body weight on 3,500 calories a day and I have a fluctuation of 100 calories here or there over, that's not as big of a deal as if I'm down to 2,000 calories a day and I have a fluctuation of 100 calories. So you have more room for error the higher your calories go. And I have, there's, there's extremism on either ends. So we see people who all they do is eat out, all they do is you know, energy uh, dense foods, you know, calorie yeah. dense foods with, with minimal um, you know, micronutrients, although people get that wrong too. Um, and they, it's kind of a, a, let's see how much garbage I can shovel in yeah. into my macros. And that's, that's not the right way to do it. And also, it's not the right way to do it to feel like, okay, I've got to hit everything right down to the gram, and I can't yeah. ever go out to eat. And if I, if, I, if I go over my macros by five grams, I just feel like I just blew the whole, no, that's not the point. The, the, flexi the more you can increase flexibility, the more you can increase adherence, and that's the most important part. People think they fail 
because they don't have the perfect diet, and that's wrong. Show me somebody who was consistent with their diet for 10 years, and I'll show you somebody who probably has a really good physique, right? Most people, they're able to be, they're able to be like spot on on something, whether it's clean eating, paleo, whatever, for eight weeks or 10 weeks or whatever, but what happens when they get to the end of it? Yeah. They blow out and they go back up to what they were or even more. And that's what we try to avoid with flexible dieting. We really try to make it a sustainable approach. My perspective on flexible dieting when I was first introduced to it was the idea of basically exchanging foods. You don't have to get a plan where all you get to eat is chicken and asparagus and some almonds. Why can't you convert that into some numbers of how much protein, carbs, and fat and change the sources for all three of those items? Uh, what that really is valuable for the athlete in is psychologically speaking, you don't become obsessed with foods that you can't have. You don't start targeting things a, or a date that you're going to uh, begin to eat those things again. If you desire something and you have the ability, like we were talking about maybe not a few weeks before a contest, but any other time, you can fit them in so that you don't develop Sometimes eating disorders can become oh, an issue. Oh, it's very popular in the fitness industry. People don't want to talk about it, but I'd say over 50% of competitors have yeah. some sort of eating disorder. And not that eating. flexible dieters can't also have oh, just eating orders. Oh, absolutely. become obsessive about um, that. Obsessive yeah. people tend to be obsessive no matter what they're involved in. But mm -hmm. I find that the system of exchange, as long as you're able to correlate you know, a protein source, a fat source, to another one that you enjoy, there's no reason why you can't enjoy And that's a great point, it. Dr. Joe Klimczewski, who's my first coach, who he just, the he didn't call it flexible dieting, <laughs> but he just gave me macros to start and was like, I don't care what you eat to hit those, you know, and uh, got in great shape, yep. you know. And uh, he said that all started because uh, his, first, his first coach gave him a, a plan that had uh, asparagus on it. And he said, well, I, I really like peas. Can I just hit the same protein, carbs, and fats per day and just have peas instead? And he was like, no. And Joe was like, why? He was like, because I said so. And Joe's like, well, that seems like a stupid reason not to do it. So yeah. he's like, it all started because I, I wanted peas instead of asparagus. I think something that may get overlooked too with flexible dieting is the idea that there's an ideal amount of meals per day or that you need to eat a certain amount of times today. And maybe that has some impact on body composition. And to a degree, there may be some influence. Well, people, but people flexibility get, could also be how many meals a day well, you sure. eat and how much you eat per meal. Sure. Well, and people, people get this wrong. So they lose the forest through the trees. So, for example, somebody will they'll say, well, what about micronutrients? Or right. what about uh, meal timing? Or what about meal frequency? Look, all that shit matters, right? Yeah. It just doesn't matter as much as hitting your daily macronutrient yeah. intake. So, we have to keep in mind our hierarchy of what's important. Hard work and consistency, daily calorie intake, daily macronutrient intake, maybe distribution, sure. timing, you know, as we go down the list. So if we've got all this shit up here checked off, then we can worry about this stuff down here. Yep. But I'm not gonna put nutrient timing above, above my daily macronutrient intake. For yep. example, you know, if, if I know I'm gonna have a dinner later in the day and that's gonna be a pretty macronutrient dense dinner, like we're going out to Fogo de Chao or something like sure. that in Vegas, that, that happened. I had, that to, train that, happened. I had yep. to train that morning. And, I, and my plan usually is I'll get 25 to 30 percent of my daily carbon intake pre and post workout because you can a little more insulin sensitive you can handle a little better you get more energy but is it a good idea for me to get that much pre and post workout and then have so little left over for that dinner i know is coming and mm -hmm. put myself in a really compromised position no i had less pre and post workout than i normally do but still sure. enough to perform well and then i left myself more macronutrients for that so Th again, that is the part of flexible dieting. Was it the absolute best thing I could have possibly done? Maybe not, but it was better than me going into fuck it mode when yeah. I got to Fogo de Chao because I knew I wouldn't be able to hit my macros and just going off on whatever. Or right? the opposite of where people are so restrictive in their flexibility that they don't leave the house, they're afraid of social situations, then the, the psychology of the athlete can suffer. Uh, you lose friendships, you can lose relationships yeah. over something as simple as just being Plastic a little more trophy. flexible on your diet. Yeah, well, I, I think you brought up a point earlier that was really important, and, and I, I post a picture of this on my Instagram, and it really hit home with people. Um, I post a picture of my daily breakfast, which is uh, five slices of bacon, center cut bacon, and uh, scrambled, egg scrambled egg beaters, and fat-free cheese. And the first time I did that, people were like, well, why don't you eat the egg yolk, blah, 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 blah. Why don't, why don't you have full-fat cheese? I said, listen, uh, I, there's nothing wrong with egg yolks. There's nothing wrong with full-fat cheese. I like bacon. And for me to make that amount of fat fit, yep. I have to take it from somewhere else. And thus, I eat the egg substitute, yep. right? If I, if I felt like, oh, you know what, I really want the whole egg today. 
I just wouldn't have that bacon. Or I wouldn't have the fat somewhere else during the day. Sure. That's the point of flexible dieting. That's what makes the difference. And I think people miss that. You know, um, you'll see, people don't understand that you have to exchange things to get benefits. Yep. So you'll see something like, well, uh, macadamia nut oil or coconut oil has MCTs in it and they may be beneficial for fat loss. That's only if you're exchanging it for something else. Right. You, you, there are no calorie negative foods. You can't just eat as much of something as Without you celery. want. I, even, so, so people will get this wrong with regards to vegetables. They'll say, well, vegetables are calorie negative. Oh. Not really, because actually, even though they're, they're definitely less calories, but actually, if you eat a high vegetable diet, your body will switch, to your, your bacterial flora will switch in your gut to become more efficient at getting calories from those vegetables. And so, you know, I've had people who said, well, I don't understand how I can not be losing weight. All I do is eat vegetables all day. Well, you're getting more calories from those vegetables than you think you are. So even with differences in body weights, I mean, they may not end up looking that different in terms of nutrition, and it may be very different. So maybe the 300 pound guy is a pretty slow metabolism relative to the 190 pound guy. Maybe he has a very fast metabolism. And so their total calorie intake may not look that different. Now. You know, protein, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of going to go off lean body mass. You know, I'm usually going to use around 1 to 1.3 pounds of grams of protein per pound of body weight or lean body mass. People will quibble back and forth over what so you need to use. So the 300-pound guy might actually have a similar protein intake because he has a similar lean body mass. Right. So with people who are kind of average body fat level, I might just use 1 gram per pound. But if somebody's, you know, a, a lot of body fat, maybe I'm going to go off their lean body mass and I'll use, like, you know, 1.2 grams per pound of lean body mass. And so I think that, um, that setting that protein is important, but looking at daily, daily calorie intake is the most important thing for fat loss. And so that's not to say protein, carbs, and fats don't matter. They just don't matter as much as your daily calorie intake. So the first thing I'll, I'll, I'll look at is, okay, let's get a food recall, right? Let's yeah. look back five days from now. What have you been eating? Is that, a, you know, we'll, we'll go through what they've been eating, how many calories they're consuming, is that a typical day of eating for you? Is this week pretty typical for you? Yes, okay, cool. Yeah. Then it's kind of like, all right, have you been maintaining? Have you been losing? Have you been gaining? And then based on that, we can kind of come up with a rough idea of what their daily calorie intake is. And the reason I like to do it that way is because that is pragmatic, right? We might do some predictive equations of what their, their metabolic rate should be based on their lean body mass, based on their activity. And a lot of times those over or underestimate just depending on if you've got outliers. Now they'll usually work about 50, 60% of the time, but for- th That 50 or 60% of the time when you're dealing with individuals, uh, that's- You're at the extremes, You're low yeah. shooting, you know? And, and that's true too, because if the If you're average, getting a diet without getting good information to, your, to someone, you're likely gonna be missing something there, be, be, yeah. be it activity level, calorie intake, yeah. You gotta have a full well, picture. Well, that, that recall, that's why I like it, because it yeah. encompasses all yeah. that, right? Because they already have their activity level, whatever it is. And so we can look back at that and say, okay, well, you're losing half a pound a week. That means you're, you're approximately in this kind of yeah. level of calorie deficit, that sort of thing. And uh, you know what? Maybe you're a little bit off when you start. But that's why we have weekly check-ins and then we yeah. adjust things based on how that person progresses. So, you know, typically if all things are equal, obviously somebody who weighs 300 pounds is going to have more lean body mass. They're going to take in more protein and more overall calories. But we've had it the same, we've had it where, you know, they just have a slower metabolism and they may be eating less, than, even like a 190 pound person. Okay. So here's how I do it. So I'll do the same thing as Lane. I'll get some answers from them. I'll get a food journal from them and we'll go over what their calorie intake is from. And then that's when we start to change the ratios a little bit, right? So basically once we discover what their protein intake is gonna be, let's just say 200 grams for this guy, and we, we know their calorie intake, I'm gonna take roughly 18 to 22% and apply that to fat for the day. And then whatever's left over, now we have a carbohydrate intake. So, so that's why it's hard to give you specific numbers on, a, on a, a person that doesn't exist or that we don't know. But those are the best indicators for just setting up those. And then, then we have the check-ins. Then we have the way of, you know, let's, let's stay in touch. Let me know what's happening this week. And that's really the value of the communication between coach and client is not just getting that initial plan and just assuming that's going to work forever. Because you know, sometimes I don't have to modify that at all, but sometimes I'm modifying oh, it every yeah. week. Sometimes and you feel bad when, you know, they check in and they're just making progress and you feel like, well, yeah. you know, it, it doesn't need to change yeah. this week. In terms of carbs and fats, I, I, I think there's certain things we shoot for, but for a, in a lot of cases, I just kind of ask the person, hey, what do you prefer? Like, because carbs and fats in a way are kind of energy filler. Like, if you get enough, like, I think 18 to 22% is a good range in terms of, like, we, we definitely want to get this in. And then, but if then if somebody likes more fats... I I'm actually have on my questionnaire, do you like more fatty foods or do you like more carbohydrates? Yeah. So that you can kind of tailor it 
Exactly. So if somebody likes more They're fats, more likely to be compliant if it's got something that they can fit in. Absolutely. Because if somebody says, you know what, I'm, hitting, I'm, I'm under on my carbs, but I end up way over on my fats. Well, then why have them feel like they're, they're constantly failing, yeah. right? Let's get, it, let's get their caloric intake still the same, but get them closer yeah. on those levels and, and give them feel like they're making some wins. You know Absolutely. what I mean? And I think that's really important. The for psychology of the athlete is often overlooked. It's just as valuable as any other aspect. You know? Yeah, so on lifting days versus off days, I mean, people have, you know, say, well, you're, you're recovering on off days, so you still need just as much, that sort of. I just based it around activity level. So if you're, if you're being more active, you're going to burn more calories, and so you'll require more calories. Typically what I will do, and I found this just by trial and error to be a reasonable kind of way to do it, is on their off days, I'll drop their carbohydrate and fat intake by 20%. And sometimes I'll go up to 30%, sometimes I'll go down to 10%, just depending on the person. But it's usually, usually 20% will get them right there. And uh, I find that that works pretty well. Or anything different? Having worked with Lane, you know, I, I noticed his strategy throughout my, my diets and I've, you know, followed up with him on that. And I find the same thing to be true. Sometimes I'll be a little more aggressive on the off days if we're in a cutting phase and I feel like, you know, I'd rather put some more emphasis on the performance. But for the most part, I'm just gonna drop them a little bit on their rest days, the carbohydrates. Uh, protein is going to stay roughly the same. N nutritional ketosis, a lot of people think, oh, if I just don't eat carbs that I'm going to be in a ketogenic state. Yeah. That's not the case. Yeah. ketogenic diet is 70 to 75 percent fat. Yeah, it's low protein actually. 20 to 30 percent protein and then low, minimal low, carbs. Low, yeah. And that's going to put you in a position where you're actually using ketones as fuel. I think most of the people that are doing ketogenic diets are actually just doing low carbohydrate right, diets. And they're not ketogenic, yeah. We have a good friend, our friend Dr. Yeah. Dominic Diagostino at USF, who does a lot of research on ketogenic diets. And I think, for like, in the case of ketogenic diets, there are very specific applications where those diets are, are, are effective. So for example, like cancer, yep. I think there's very, very compelling evidence that it slows tumor progression. Yep. Um, epilepsy, it can reduce incidences of seizure. Alzheimer's. Has Alzheimer's, been. yeah. Mm -hmm. But, the problem with these diets, and Dom will acknowledge this, is compliance is extremely low. It's lifestyle dependent. Right, because you're basically, you, for you to stay in ketosis, if you have one high carb meal, it will pull you out of ketosis. And then you've got to go all through that hell of adapting again. Uh, I, my, uh, my mother went on a ketogenic diet, and you know she was able to maintain it for a while, but had a really hard time maintaining it. Dad actually did for a while back. And uh, he lost 30 pounds, but then when he got off the ketogenic diet, went back to eating normal, he put back on 50. Now, actually, so that, Dom, that's the, the, problem. Dom the, the guy we're talking about, he works in a lab for 14, 16 hours a day sometimes, and he likes the ketogenic diet for his lifestyle because he doesn't get hungry. He has two meals per day. He has high energy. He's able to focus, not be so worried about getting uh, you know, a meal every couple hours. So for him, it, there's a benefit. Most people, it's hard to avoid carbohydrates. Yeah, I mean, if you're basically, if you want to do a ketogenic lifestyle, you're basically saying, I'm never going to eat carbs again and starches. And I mean, let's be honest with yourself. How reasonable is that as a goal? Now, I will tell you, if I found out I had cancer tomorrow, I would be on a ketogenic diet. Yep. And I have enough willpower that I'm pretty sure I could stick to it. And if I started you know? forgetting your name if every was, four hours, <laughs> I would be having yeah. a ketogenic diet. If it, if it was, yeah, if it was, if it was something where it was like my life or my health or this, I could do that. Yeah. But if I can, you know, live a live a healthy life and have carbohydrates, then I'm gonna have carbohydrates because it increases my ability to be adherent to the diet. And I have to be honest about you know things like paleo diet or grapefruit diet or any of those things. I, Gra I really diets? I don't know. I'm not gonna say it. Maybe they should put that in the space porn. There we go. But I, I'm not. I don't really get too involved in those things because anything that's got a gimmicky name or a gimmicky title. It just doesn't resonate with me. It's not something I'm going to use. It's not something I'm going to get other people to use. If, if it you, says the insert word diet, it's probably garbage. The beautiful thing about flexible dieting is it's not ex exclusive from any of those things. You can yes. probably do paleo and be a, be a flexible Absolutely. dieter. You're still hitting numbers. You can be a, you can be a clean eater and still yeah. be a flexible dieter. You're just choosing these foods that are considered clean. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't like fad diets. No, exactly. And flexible dieting is not, a, and I, it's funny, I get, you know, people who make comments on social media, somebody said, well, I tried the IAFYM diet and it didn't work. I said, then you don't understand what it is. It, I, it is a diet, uh, flexible dieting is a specific diet, like periodization training is a specific training program. It is not a diet. No. It is a system of tracking and being accountable, just yeah. like periodization is a system of programming that can encompass millions of different ways to program, right? And I think that's it. Like there are, like when Dr. Zoltis talks about, there are endless possibilities for yep. programming. There's endless possibilities for how you program a flexible diet. Same way. And we've, we've all become, you know, as a coach, um, I think Corey Probst, 
uh, said it really well. Uh, our friend who's doctor. doing doctor. Soon to be doctor. Soon, Soon to be doctor. Oh, okay. yeah. She's doing a PhD in psychology, and she's, she's in San Diego. She has some like mind blowing things that she says, and she said, um, "Self control is fatiguing." Okay, and any of us who have ever done some kind of restrictive diet know that. Like by the end, you're literally just tired from dieting, right? Yeah. And you also, you don't get to like you don't want something that requires the max amount of willpower when you do it, because you don't get to pick where your willpower comes from. It's not like you have willpower for your job and willpower for your husband or wife, or willpower for your kids and willpower for your training, and willpower for your nutrition. It all comes from the same spot. So when do we find ourselves really getting off course in terms of our training and our nutrition? It's when we have a really stressful time in our lives, we have a lot going on. So we want something that really requires the minimal amount of input for us to be able to maintain it, right? Because even if we're not able to do it to the best of our ability, if we're still being consistent, it's way better than just saying, fuck it, I'm, not, I'm just eating whatever I want, I'm not going to the gym, right? Yep. So that's, so, and, and I talked about this with, um, uh, with some of my clients and, and Corey pointed it out um, when somebody you know has a tough time or they're 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 struggling with hitting macros or whatever I look at okay what what are ways we can increase this adherence and sometimes it means I'm ra raising macros up faster than I want to like Lauren for example uh, when she finished dieting a, a few years ago she was like Lane I know we should do a slow reverse diet but I just want to feel normal faster and I'm okay with some body fat gain to do that that is a completely, it is not my job to judge somebody if they're comfortable with some body fat gain or they're comfortable at a certain body fat. It's not my judge to tell, job to tell them where they should do it. All I care about is are they happy and being yeah. healthy and having a consistent lifestyle, right? And so Corey said, she's like, what you're doing is you're giving them autonomy. You're not, they're not, they're, so they can keep doing it for them. They're not doing it for you. And a lot of coaches, what do they say? No, you're gonna do this and you're gonna do it how I told you to do it or you know, whatever. Then you're taking that person's power away, yeah. right? You want somebody to do it for them. And if they do it for them, if they maintain that autonomy, they're probably gonna be more adherent and be more motivated over time. A lot, a lot of what we do as coaches is basically give people the ability to succeed using the best tools right. that they have available, not, not following some philosophy or belief that we have. Exactly. And, you know, people like, like Lauren and Katie, they would have been successful no matter what. I firmly believe that. I just like to think that, you know, we opened up a door, they walked through it, yeah. and it allowed them to, to not shortcut, but they got there maybe a little bit faster than they would have if they had to figure it out on their own.